Greetings adventurers and welcome to another installment of Ahmed's World Time Trek. Today we continue our journey following the renowned military commander and leader Napoleon Bonaparte. Strap in as we transport through time to 1797 and beyond. In April 1797, Napoleon Bonaparte engaged in negotiations with Austria and Venice, aiming to secure favorable terms for France. He believed that the time for peace had come and wanted to dictate the conditions, provided they were reasonable. The negotiations with Austria began on April 15, with Napoleon conceding to the Austrian demand that the pavilion where the negotiations took place be declared neutral ground. However, Napoleon made it clear that the French army surrounded the neutral ground, giving France an advantage. During the negotiations, Napoleon asserted that the French Republic did not require recognition since it was already a significant power in Europe. Austria offered to recognize the French Republic on the condition that it maintained the same etiquette as the former monarchy. Napoleon dismissed the issue of etiquette, stating that the French were indifferent to it. Napoleon believed that if Generals Moreau and Hoche crossed the Rhine River and entered Austrian territory, France's position would be greatly strengthened. He argued that rivers had never been considered serious obstacles in military operations and expressed confidence that Moreau could cross the Rhine. Moreau eventually crossed the river, followed by Hoche, but they had to halt their armies while the peace negotiations proceeded. Napoleon also dealt with the city-state of Venice, which sought to protect its independence but lacked the military strength to do so. Napoleon demanded that Venice choose between war and peace, warning them not to underestimate France's power. Although the French had legitimate grievances against Venice for its pro-Austrian leanings and hostile actions, Napoleon employed a bullying approach. When an uprising occurred in Verona, part of the Venetian Republic, where French soldiers were massacred, Napoleon vowed to take severe measures and punish the Venetians. On April 19, 1797, Napoleon signed the preliminaries of Leo Ben, which marked a significant shift in the balance of power between Napoleon and the Directory in Paris. Although it was not the final comprehensive peace treaty, which would be signed in October 1797 at Campo Formio, Napoleon negotiated and signed the preliminaries himself. Under the terms of the agreement, Austria ceded territories such as the duchies of Milan and Medina, as well as the Austrian Netherlands, to France. Austria recognized the constitutional limits of France, extending to the Rhine, and France recognized the integrity of the rest of the Austrian Empire. Secret clauses also stipulated that Austria would renounce its Italian possessions west of the Oglio River to the Cispadane Republic, while receiving territories from Venice and other concessions. Napoleon assumed that he would be able to dispose of Venetian territory before the treaty was ratified. Overall, these negotiations and agreements laid the groundwork for future diplomatic and territorial changes in Europe. Napoleon's negotiations and actions during this period seemed to benefit Austria outwardly, as the territorial integrity of Austria was respected and the left bank of the Rhine was to be discussed at a later date. However, Napoleon believed that he had strategically outmaneuvered Austria and achieved his own goals. In his communication with the Directory, Napoleon defended his negotiations by claiming that he had pursued the most effective plan for defeating the Emperor. He downplayed his own role, stating that he considered himself insignificant in the operations he directed. He expressed a desire to return home and promised a simple civil career. The terms of the Leo Ben Agreement seemed satisfactory to Austria at the time. Some attempts at bribery were made by the Duke of Medina and the Austrian negotiators, but Napoleon rejected them, emphasizing that his greatness would come from France. Minor concerns of the Austrian negotiator, Gallo, such as the size of the seals, were accommodated by Napoleon. The incident involving the Venetians firing on a French sea captain provided Napoleon with a pretext to take aggressive action against Venice. He demanded the expulsion of the British ambassador and pro-Bourbon French émigrés, the surrender of British goods, a monetary contribution, and the arrest of those responsible for the sea captain's death. Napoleon ignored the Venetian doge's promise of reparations for the Verona massacre and demanded the evacuation of Venice's mainland territories. Napoleon encouraged revolts in Brescia and Bergamo and declared war on Venice. He imposed punishments on Verona, including fines and confiscations of property. Within 10 days of the war's start, Napoleon orchestrated a coup d'état in Venice, leading to the dissolution of the Doge and Senate after 1,200 years of independence. The new pro-French puppet government of Venice agreed to provide ships, pay a monetary contribution, and hand over territories desired by France. 
In May 23, street fighting erupted in Genoa between pro-French Giacobini Democrats and the Genovese authorities. The government prevailed, and evidence revealed the involvement of Salicidi and Faipolt in the failed uprising. Despite being angry with the Genoese Democrats for acting prematurely, Napoleon used the deaths of Frenchmen as a pretext to send Lavalette to negotiate with the Genovese government. They eventually surrendered, and Napoleon personally drafted a constitution for the new Ligurian Republic, based on the French Constitution of 1795. The constitution introduced a bicameral legislature, religious freedom, civic equality, and local self-government. These principles did not align with the strict Jacobinism of his earlier days or a supposed Corsican desire for vengeance against Genoa. Napoleon even reprimanded the Democrats for destroying the statue of Andrea Doria, praising Doria's achievements as a sailor and statesman and offering to contribute to the statue's restoration. Throughout these negotiations and actions, Napoleon asserted his authority and pursued his own agenda, often bypassing the Directory's involvement. He presented himself as a selfless leader and downplayed his own achievements, while consolidating French power and extending French influence in the region. In the spring of 1797, Napoleon resided at the Palazzo of Mombello near Milan. He brought his family to live with him, including his mother, siblings, and uncle. He adopted a quasi-courtly etiquette, hosting Italian nobility at his table and displaying a taste for flunkies. Napoleon funded this lavish lifestyle with a fortune estimated to be around 300,000 to 3 million francs. According to Mayat de Melito's memoirs, Napoleon expressed his ambition to undermine the Republican Party for his own benefit during a walk in the Garden of Mombello. However, the authenticity of this account is questionable, as it seems unlikely that Napoleon would reveal such treacherous ambitions to a public functionary like Mayat. During this time, Napoleon also began interfering in the love lives of his siblings. He arranged the marriage of his sister Elisa to Captain Felice Bossiacci, who later received promotions and became a senator and prince of Lucca. Napoleon also encouraged the marriage of his sister Pauline to General Charles Leclerc, despite her being in love with someone else. Additionally, he played a role in the courtship and marriage of his sister Caroline to cavalryman Marat. Overall, Napoleon's time in Mombello was marked by a grandiose lifestyle, family gatherings, and his involvement in the personal affairs of his siblings. In Paris, the Directory faced significant challenges. Inflation was rampant, with the cost of shoes increasing 40-fold since 1790 and the value of paper money, assignats, plummeting to 1% of its face value. Discontent with the government was evident, and on May 26, the constitutional royalist Marquis de Barthélemy became a director after royalist gains in elections. The directory now consisted of Barras, Carnot, Reubel, Louis de la Revelière Lepo, and Barthélemy, with the first four being regicides. Napoleon, who had played a crucial role in saving the Republic in the past, was concerned about the rise of royalists and sent Lavalette to Paris to monitor the situation. Lavalette discovered plots for the return of the Bourbons, one of which involved General Charles Pichigrou, as well as conspiracies on the extreme left. François-Noël Babouf, a journalist and agitator with communist ideas, was guillotined in late May. Opposition to Napoleon's actions in the National Assembly also irked him. When Deputy Joseph Dumoulard criticized the treatment of Venice and accused France, meaning Napoleon, of violating international law by interfering in the affairs of sovereign states, Napoleon reacted strongly. In his Bastille Day proclamation to the army, Napoleon warned the domestic opposition that the royalists would cease to exist when they revealed themselves. He promised relentless war against the enemies of the Republic and the Constitution. He held grand celebrations in Milan shortly after, aiming to demonstrate to France that the Army of Italy was more loyal to the Republic than the gentlemen of the Army of the Rhine. Tensions between the two forces were evident when fights broke out between officers upon Bernadotte's division arriving in Italy. Napoleon's relationship with Bernadotte, who later married Napoleon's ex-fiancée, Desiree Clary, was strained and would worsen in the following year. Overall, the Directory faced economic turmoil and political challenges, with opposition from both royalists and extreme leftists. Napoleon was determined to protect the Republic and its ideals, making bold proclamations and asserting the loyalty of his army. On July 7, 1797, Napoleon published the constitution of the new Cisalpine Republic, which included Milan as its capital and several other Italian territories. The constitution, based on that of France, was drafted under Napoleon's direction. He appointed the directors and legislators himself to ensure a favorable government composition. The creation of this republic was a significant step toward fostering an Italian national identity and served Napoleon's strategic interests by providing a unified Italian state as a buffer against Austrian aggression. In Paris, the political situation became precarious. 
General Hoche's appointment as war minister, despite being under the minimum age requirement, led to accusations of violating the constitution, forcing his resignation. Napoleon, who was also below the age requirement, perceived a threat to the Republic and expressed his concerns to the Directory. Political deadlock ensued as the separation of powers between the Directory and the Assembly hindered effective governance. On July 17, Charles Maurice de Talleyrand became Foreign Minister, marking the beginning of his four terms in the post. Talleyrand, known for his cunning and self-interest, sought Napoleon's friendship and received an equally flattering response. While Napoleon initially admired Talleyrand, he eventually saw through his duplicity and felt personally betrayed. In late July, Napoleon decided to support a purge of the French government and legislature led by Barras. He sent Augereau, a strong Republican, to Paris to assist in the coup. With Pichegru and Barbe Marbois assuming key positions in the legislative chambers, Barras sought Napoleon's political support, military strength, and financial resources. Lavalette is believed to have taken a significant sum of money to Paris to buy influence prior to the planned coup. The Fructidor coup took place on September 4, 1797, and was successful. Augereau strategically occupied important points in Paris, arrested numerous deputies and editors, and sent them to prison. The legislative chambers passed laws against certain individuals and annulled upcoming elections in pro-royalist departments. The Directory gained increased powers to suppress newspapers and political clubs. The Army of Italy's support secured the triumph of the Directory, at least temporarily. The officer corps also underwent a purge, with suspected crypto-royalist generals, including General Kellerman, being dismissed. Napoleon received the news with great joy and was not personally held responsible by Carnot, one of the coup's victims. Carnot claimed that he had proposed Napoleon for the Italian command and accused Barras of becoming an enemy of Napoleon. Napoleon believed this, and when he assumed power, he recalled Carnot to the war ministry. Although Napoleon was not directly involved in the intrigue, he closely followed the events through Lavalette's detailed account. He was preoccupied with negotiating peace in Italy at the time of the coup. However, upon Lavalette's return, Napoleon extensively discussed the events with him. Henri Clark, Carnot's protégé, was recalled to Paris, leaving Napoleon as the sole representative in the Campo Formio peace negotiations. Napoleon was frustrated with the Austrian plenipotentiary, Count Ludwig von Cobenzl, during negotiations. He referred to the negotiations as a joke and expressed difficulty in dealing with Cobenzl. In a discussion about the Ionian Isles, Napoleon reportedly smashed either a piece of antique china or a tea set in front of Cobenzl. However, Cobenzl remained calm and reported back to Vienna. Despite his anger, Napoleon could control his emotions. Napoleon frequently complained about his health and threatened to resign due to lack of appreciation from the government. He criticized the difficulty of negotiating with Cobenzl and questioned the value of fighting for Italy, calling it an enervated, superstitious, and cowardly nation. He felt that Italy did not provide enough support during his campaign. On October 13, 1797, Napoleon learned that the mountains were covered in snow, making the roads impassable. Realizing that reinforcements from the Army of the Rhine would be impossible, Napoleon decided peace must be made. On October 17, Napoleon and Cobenzl signed the Treaty of Campo Formio. The treaty resulted in territorial exchanges, with Austria ceding Belgium and the west bank of the Rhine to France, and France acquiring the Ionian Isles from Venice. Austria obtained territories in Italy and recognized the Ligurian and Cisalpine republics. The treaty also established a customs union between France and Austria. Despite potential criticism of the treaty, Napoleon argued that a better deal could only be achieved through more war, which he deemed unlikely to succeed. The treaty was ratified by the Directory, and Napoleon sent representatives to Paris to promote its merits. In conclusion, Napoleon's negotiations with Cobenzl were frustrating, and he expressed his dissatisfaction in his letters. However, he successfully concluded the Treaty of Campo Formio, bringing an end to the war with Austria. After the signing of the Treaty of Campo Formio, Napoleon turned his attention to his next priority, defeating England. He believed that destroying the Anglican monarchy was crucial for the survival of the French government. He appointed Talleyrand to command the Army of England and began preparations for a naval campaign. Napoleon focused on strengthening France's naval capabilities by ordering the construction of troop-carrying gunboats, and having artillery expert Colonel Antoine Andriossi cast guns in the same caliber as English cannons. He also sent a list of the bravest soldiers from the Army of Italy to be awarded golden sabers of honor. Napoleon made a grand tour through various cities, including Turin, Chambéry, Geneva, Bern, and Ball, where he was celebrated by the crowds. He arrived at the Congress of Rastatt in a carriage drawn by eight horses, wanting to create a visual impact similar to that of European monarchs. 
Overall, Napoleon's focus shifted towards planning a campaign against England while also ensuring recognition for the achievements of the Army of Italy. After the Treaty of Campo Formio was ratified at Rastatt, Austria was compelled to give up several strongholds and withdraw its forces from certain areas. Napoleon recognized the opportunity to gain support from the German states outside of Austria and Prussia, positioning France as their protector against the designs of those larger powers. He saw the concept of Germany as a means to further French interests. During the negotiations, Napoleon had a chance to display his diplomatic rudeness when Baron Axel von Fersen, Marie Antoinette's former lover and a delegate from the King of Sweden, visited him. Napoleon insulted von Fersen, criticizing his support for the French government in exile. Von Fersen was subsequently recalled. Napoleon left Rastatt for Paris on December 2, 1797. He maintained a low profile in the capital, avoiding political involvement and appearing rarely in public. Despite this, his presence caused a sensation among the people of Paris, who eagerly sought glimpses of the conqueror of Italy. Napoleon bought a house on Rue Chanterine, which was later renamed Rue de la Victoire in his honor. Napoleon was cautious during his time in Paris, fearing for his safety due to the public's calls for him to become king. He avoided politics and limited his social circle to a select group of generals, scientists, and diplomats. He believed that the Parisians would soon forget his victories. On December 6, Napoleon had a meeting with Talleyrand, and they formed a favorable impression of each other. He dined privately with the Directory, receiving a warm reception from some members but a colder one from others. The government organized a grand welcoming ceremony for Napoleon at the Luxembourg Palace, where he adopted a modest demeanor despite the enthusiastic crowd. Napoleon skillfully mastered the art of placing himself in the limelight while appearing modest. During his grand welcoming ceremony at the Luxembourg Palace, attended by the elite of Paris, the atmosphere was characterized by curiosity rather than genuine joy. Talleyrand introduced Napoleon with flattery, and he praised the Campo Formio Treaty and his soldiers' commitment to the French Constitution. Barris delivered a speech comparing Napoleon to great historical figures and called for the defeat of Britain. The directors embraced Napoleon after his speech, but this display was seen as a theatrical performance. On Christmas Day, Napoleon was elected as a member of the prestigious Institut de France, replacing the exiled Carnot. This intellectual achievement brought him happiness, and he often wore the Institute's uniform and attended science lectures. Napoleon considered his intellectual credentials important not only to impress the French people, but also to gain the respect of the soldiers. He had a genuine intellectual curiosity and was well-read in various subjects. He impressed leading European intellectuals and creative figures of the time. Napoleon displayed tact by attending the anniversary celebrations of Louis XVI's execution in his institute uniform, rather than his military attire, sitting in the third row instead of alongside the directors. At a reception hosted by Talleyrand in his honor, Napoleon displayed awkwardness with women. He was annoyed by Madame Germaine de Staël's constant presence, despite her admiration for him. When she asked him about the best kind of woman, expecting a compliment, Napoleon replied that it was the one who had the most children, revealing his fundamental attitude towards women. Napoleon turned his attention to the invasion of Britain and met with Wolf Tone, the leader of the United Irishmen, for assistance. Despite Tone's modesty about his military abilities, Napoleon considered his bravery sufficient. However, after evaluating the chances of a successful invasion during his visits to various coastal cities, he concluded that it was too hazardous and decided not to attempt it. Instead, Napoleon proposed alternative operations to the Directory, including focusing on the Rhine to threaten British interests in Hanover or launching an eastern expedition to disrupt British trade routes. If none of these options were feasible, he suggested concluding peace. The Directory chose the option of an invasion of Egypt, seeing it as a way to either extend French influence or diminish Napoleon's reputation if he failed. For Napoleon, it was an opportunity to emulate his heroes, Alexander the Great and Julius Caesar, and potentially use Egypt as a gateway to India. The Directory granted Napoleon carte blanche to prepare for and lead the Egyptian campaign, partly to remove him from Parisian society and partly to please influential segments of society. Napoleon saw the potential of Egypt as a means to achieve great renown, stating that, all the great reputations have come from Asia. A scandal emerged in which smaller firms, such as the company Bowdoin, were accused of corrupt practices in army provisioning. Napoleon discovered that among the investors in the company Bowdoin were Barris, Hippolyte Charles, and even Josephine. This revelation threatened Napoleon's integrity and his appeal to the public. Napoleon and Joseph interrogated Josephine about her involvement, but she denied everything and showed her continued affection for Hippolyte Charles. 
she expressed her desire to escape her marriage and cover her tracks Josephine urged Charles to have Bowden deny any knowledge of her involvement, and instructed him to take certain actions to protect themselves. With the corruption and turmoil surrounding him in Paris, Napoleon saw the need to distance himself from the city, which he associated with disloyalty and embarrassment. He wanted to maintain his image as a noble knight and felt that both the Directory and Josephine's actions were threatening that ideal. As Napoleon considered his upcoming campaign in Egypt, he had numerous motivations to leave Paris behind. The city had become synonymous in his mind with corruption, disloyalty, personal pain, hidden malice, and the potential for significant embarrassment. Napoleon had always held a vision of himself as a noble knight, akin to the protagonist in his own short story, Clisson. However, the actions of both the Directory and Josephine posed a threat to this idealized self-image. Given the circumstances, Napoleon felt compelled to take decisive action once more. He recognized the need to elevate the stakes and embark on a new endeavor. By leaving Paris and undertaking the ambitious campaign in Egypt, he sought to escape the city's negative associations and reaffirm his vision of himself as a valiant and honorable leader. And so in order to escape the troubles in Paris and embark on a quest for further renown, Napoleon resolved to lead the French on an expedition to Egypt. While risks lay ahead, it presented opportunities to elevate his status on the global stage. Thank you all for joining me once more on this historical adventure. Be sure to subscribe and tune in next time as we witness Napoleon depart for Egypt and the beginning of this new chapter. Until then, safe travels through the corridors of time.